my far left is our, um, Mark Gage, who's one of the founders of Gage Clemenceau Architects, and he's the assistant dean and associate professor at Yale. Um, Jesse Reiser um, has a firm, Reiser Umamoto RUR, here in New York. He's the director of the Master of Architecture program and a professor of architecture at Princeton. Um, John McMurrow is um, a principal of the firm Studio APT and is the chair of the architecture program at the University of Michigan. Um, and um, Michael Meredith, um, who's a, a, who teaches at Princeton and is a principal of Moss. Um, and most importantly, um, at the very far end of the table is Marcelo Spina, one of the partners of Patterns and the, one of the co-authors of the book Embedded. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey, um, for the introduction and also for uh, connecting us with this, what seems to me like a very fantastic uh, venue, um, kind of open venue, with an open agenda and active across um, all sorts of events, including this one. Um, thanks, Nicola, and everyone at, uh, at Studio X. Um, <coughs> I, well, I also want to acknowledge. Um, the you know the kind of nature of the collaboration. This is obviously the work of, of the whole office, uh, mainly my partner Georgina Ulrich that is not here, and back in Los Angeles, and you know a number of people over a number of years, uh, you know, like, like everyone involved in architecture and doing this sort of thing. You know that this is obviously never the work of a, of a few people. So um, I also want to thank everyone uh, for coming to this. At the, Everyone here somehow has like uh, something to do with the work uh, we do, either because of uh, having had a kind of mentorship role at uh, you know at teaching when I you know I was at Columbia and I was in Jesse studio and you know through his office and seeing the way they were doing things uh, you know with Nanako uh, or you know colleagues that uh, have like um, that I think we learn a lot through the, the work discussions, uh, reviews, or just seeing the work. I mean, we are, usually we always saw the, you know, we always sit, seek to produce work in a, you know, that, that would be in, on the field, no? And I think this is really, uh, this is really important, especially when you actually set up to, you know, to make a contribution such as the first book. Um, so I'm not gonna describe too much about the book. I think, you know, that's why you certainly do things like that. I'll just try to set up a few things as a reference, and so hopefully we can then have a discussion that will start there and maybe move to some other place. Um, the, I guess a little bit of the, I mean, Nicola was asking me like you know, the relationship, because many of the, the events and times I go to the most of the urban, or they have something to do with the city, and of course I couldn't really come up with like, a particular direct relationship that our work will have with this city. Um, uh, in terms of the, the obvious specificity of it, but it has everything to do in terms of like the, the sort of seeds of where uh, you know some of the ideas you know definitely started. So it goes back to the 90s and the middle of the 90s. So anyway, the, I want to talk about like three things. And uh, one it has to do with the context of the book. The other one with the um, you know the concept, which obviously relates to the con to the um, to the context. And then you know a little bit of a of it as, a, as an object, no. Um, the context has something to do with like what I we always perceive to be a kind of dilemma of our generation, and and I would be you know very very clear on that. It seems like everyone here, with the exception of Jesse, is like is it's one generation, let's say, and Jesse. And I think it's Grandpa <laughs> Jesse. Yeah. Anyway, uh, no, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. Um, it means that these are people that I, uh, you know, that we study with and learn, and they had a kind of, you know, huge re relevance on, on, on the field and the discipline, no? and they continue to have that. But our dilemma, and this is always a conversation we had a lot, is like, were we a generation of practice, you know, and Mike and I had this, you know, this discussion, and, and I always felt, I mean, I think there's something to it, you know, and compared to, let's say, maybe our previous generation, uh, that you know, we're dealing with things. Uh, maybe had a different task to deal with things mostly from from the outside. Had a lot to kind of you know carry on, and, and there was a lot of you know there was a particular shift between the <coughs> philosophy to you know to architecture, you know, kind of uh, 
I mean, kind of like cross disciplinary aspects to to the field at the time. So, were we a generation of uh, practice, or lots of people would advocate that you know, obviously, where it was a digital generation, we were part of it, and certainly that was true as well. And and all of these things that at some time begin to like stick to your work, it begins to stick to your group. Uh, they begin to like you know produce sort of certain baggage and certain weight and. I never felt particularly comf uh, comf comfortable with uh, each of those things, you know, and, and on their own, because I always think that they are very, very reactive. And so the intention of the book or the context around what we were trying to do was position the work a little bit of, as a as a, um, as something that I saw it was a you know a way out of that dilemma. Let's say a practice versus you know like uh, theory, uh, digital versus non-digital, and all sorts of you know problems, interior versus exterior, and so on. So the idea of being entrenched, and this is something that I I always perceived that was true to our um, uh, to a certain group of people, uh, not just age related, had to do with like operating well within the field, you know, being entrenched, being kind of you know embedded. Obviously, it's a, it's a word that, that that we decided to you know to settle on, and taking on that you will understand the the, the problems, the problematics of practice, but also understand the problematics of the discipline at large, and intend the work to be kind of relevant in both. No, um, assuming that also you know in the particularities of being embedded it has the kind of problematics of being sometimes too close to the um, you know too close to the thing. One could remember the, the play right that um, that was done during the Iraq war that you know during the whole issue of like journalism being embedded with the troops and had like not much objectivity with this thing. So you know there's certain risk about like operating at that level and I think that's obviously part of uh, part of the issue that I like to put out there. Um, so it's a little bit of a reality in our view of something that I think kind of pertains to a, a, a lot of other people and a little bit of an aspiration of like you know of operating in such a way. Um, the the concept you know behind that it obviously goes beyond let's say certain political position like you have to kind of put yourself into that sort of orbit of work and take on the risk of uh, of, of the and the perils of let's say either practicing or building or you know producing work that maybe sometimes is either perceived as too experimental uh, or too conventional in some way. And I think this is, these are all things that have always been uh, attractive to me, and how to kind of find the, the sort of fine tune the right balance of that as a young architect, as, a, as, a, as somebody that you know, aspiring to you know to definitely um, you know leave a mark on what you're doing. No? Um, it also has to do with the sensibility, you know, where like maybe aesthetics come in, come in, where like the idea of constantly infiltrating, you know, what like are assumed as like genres, let's say, either formal aesthetic genres where like you're trying to mix things, uh, not in a kind of collagistic manner, but in a manner that um, implies a certain evolution, uh, and not in a manner in a kind of oppositional way, uh, let's say a box versus a block, but in ways that actually are, to me, always more natural, and obviously this comes a lot with our, you know, our education as well, no? Uh, to try, you know, constantly find ways out of the of sort of the dichotomies of uh, of the of the aesthetic prevalences, let's say, in the mainstream or non-mainstream, um, and also finds ways that work and so on. Uh, so issues from the like, expertise to a certain, you know, collaboration uh, of the idea of matter as a kind of philosophical aspect to the problem of material as a kind of real, and, and the certain understanding that one and uh, have to come. To maintain in both, um, so breaking that those varieties, and then I mean just to conclude, um, the object itself as a book, it was important that it will read through these things, or someone will read through that. And again, it's not to explain the movie or or, or those things because I think those things meant to be experienced. But the idea of creating a continuum where, let's say, uh, very much the way we tend to work. Where it's not a theory that precedes the work, and neither like just uh, mindless doing uh, for doing sake, but rather find things kind of in a, in a sort of more horizontal level, where let's say uh, texts, images, photos, drawings are all sort of um, working together in a, in a kind of dialogue, uh, where ideas are not like uh, overarching, um, dogmatic. Um, uh, a priori takes on the world of practice, but rather uh, kind of you know parallel um, 
parallel understandings or reflections or, or, or criticism of, of what we do. So these are sort of, you know, so there's a, an idea that like these things are kind of entrenched within the world of like of projects and those projects are appearing in a, in a, in a, in a kind of natural way. So, um, I mean, I guess that's, the, it's a little bit of, I mean, I think like one thing, and this is like, uh, I guess if you're an architect and you have to, you're interested in this, uh, you are at some point uh, confronted with the world of publishing or like, uh, and publishing is one thing, but then publishing a book is a different thing altogether because it's like, especially in the first book, I remember having a discussion with Neil Denari and uh, about like, you know, a contract on a, you know, with a very good publisher we had earlier and, uh, and about the constraints going on with that and he was saying like, there's just too many books out there and not that many good books to not like, uh, have full control of, the, of, uh, of especially the first book you're going to make to try to just like, you know, uh, if it's going to suck, it's going to suck on your own terms. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and if it's going to be, it's going to be just on your own terms. So, um, anyway, so John, oh, okay. uh, he's going to have, well, John brought, John is one of the contributors of the book, so. Uh, yes, uh, Marcella asked me to come tonight to say a few words in relation to the event. Um, I've already written a few words in relation to the event and writing the afterward. It's a very brief text, um, so I'm going to propose to read it. It's five minutes or so, so you can judge your attention span. Uh, the name of the piece is uh, Pieces to Patterns Towards a Unified Field Theory of Architecture. The work of patterns, as contained in this book, demonstrate the struggles of an emerging practice, one that is sought throughout its endeavors to articulate a mode of coherence within the scope of the architectural. To, in order to frame the historic that underlies the current, presented here are a triangulation of timely and seemingly archaic topics that position the contemporary work of patterns within the trajectory of rejections, inversions, continuances that constitutes architecture's ongoing disciplinary concerns. In physics, a unified field theory is one that allows what are usually thought as fundamental forces and elementary particles to be written in terms of a single causality. The term was coined by Einstein, hoping to discover an approximation for quantum theory, attempting to unify the general theory of relativity with electromagnetism. There is, however, no accepted unified field theory. It remains an open line of research, but the promise of it has been a motivating ambition in theoretical physics. The parallel ambition can said to animate architectural resource, research, and though it is not always overtly articulated as such, the objective of coherence over the disparate can be seen as a consistent motivator of architectural innovation. Within this frame, the work of pattern ties to the most perennial and still most pressing of architectural concerns, namely the determination of what regulates architectural form. In the pursuit of higher levels of consistency, the work of patterns can be understood as developing along three axes, unformed to delineated, from component to assemblage, and finally from pieces to pattern, unformed to delineated. The first obstacles of architectural coherence are the difficulties arising from the process of concept formulation to its realization. The struggle has to do with the ways in which architecture as a material process needs to find the means to make the inchoate forces of its operation resolve in something resembling order. The work of patterns, in the work of patterns, this difficulty is often circumnavigated by the process of drawing, literal delineations. But more than the process of specification alone, we can take these delineations to also in, imply and move to describe, portray, and set forth with accuracy or detail to make first that which is realized. For patterns, the work of delineation is systematically rendered rendering the deployment of linearity itself, often in the form of graphic smoothness. The meridians of the sweeping line are a recurrent motif which give the work uh, the imprint of continuity. It is the measured line that instills the work with a sense of motion, connection, and dare we say, grace. Component to assemblage. The realization of architecture building requires an exorbitant amount of matter and its various material systems, including structural, mechanical, enclosure, and finish each with a branching list of even finer degrees of distinction and difference. In the end, it's a lot of stuff to control. With the overwhelming particulate componentry of modern building practice emerging as one of the thorny issues in the pursuit of architectural consistency. It was arguably, <coughs> arguably easier in earlier times with stone and, excuse me, I have a cold. 
uh, with stone and masonry construction of individual units having the advantage of a relatively limited material palette. Uh, in that same is brought forth an inherent continuity. The question of component construction was how utility was made of disparity. The logic of construction today could be understood as the assemblage of parts, not in terms of their individuation, but rather their collection. Uh, these issues of modern construction have seen a number of treatments in the work of patterns, most notably in the early project for their research into the monocoque, a, concrete, uh, a construction technique that supports structural load by using the object's exterior, as opposed to the internal frame or truss that's then covered with a non-lone bearing skin. The word monocoque coming from the Greek mono and French coque for shell, this seeming throwback to earlier forms of material sameness in the interest of continuity, pattern understands the monocoque as a rhetorical trope, an image of continuity in which the material imagination of architecture can aspire, essentially a resistant figure to the proliferation of pieces, and in welcome contrast to the many contemporaries who seem to be under the thrall of multiplicities per se, usually in the form of massively customized computer-aided fabrication, typically involving <coughs> conspicuously large numbers of numbered plywood parts, <laughs> pieces to patterns. If the first system of coherence concerns geometry and the second construction, the third describes the relations between the individual pieces to overall regulations of pattern. This consideration of coherence is the implicit topic of both geometry and construction, but can also be understood as a topic in its own right as it describes the regulating motivations of the overall construction. In coming to groups with how individuated elements, i.e. pieces, are made suitable for both macro and micro forms of scale or congruencies, for our purposes pattern, the architecture articulates its most fundamental claims, that of the al alchemic formulation of the discipline, the whole of architecture is made more than the sum of its parts. The struggle for the post-collage generation of architects, of which patterns as a member, has been how to make a unity of congruence rather than difference while understanding the inevitability of pieces and parts. As a concept, the pattern is the late, latest in a litany of frameworks by which architectural desire for consistency has been framed through its history, proportion, scale, outline, mass, each in turn serving as the model and guide for the field. The name of the practice patterns clearly indicates the motivations for the work, but the success of its engagements can be verified in action, not in the nominalism of the term but in the exemplarity of the production that patterns offers as a substantial contribution to these problematics. The patterns are an image which unites disparity. The closing paragraph of Rainer Banham's essay, The New Brutalism, refers to such topological arrangements. Perhaps the motivations of early brutalism are fellow travelers with patterns in the office in the shared pursuit at the nexus of image and presence. In the making of a practice, both in the building of the work that is produced, but also in the ideas that inform them, architects are confronted with a shifting terrain of circumstance, economic, political, material, social and historical, and disciplinary. The navigation of these contexts in the whole makes the practice and the sum of the practices the possibility of the field. In the context and variegation of the work patterns, makes an important contribution to the idea of building and the building of ideas with work that is utterly contemporary, however, at the same time, articulates perennial issues. So uh, the, the idea is that um, um, everyone would say a few words about, um, about Pattern's work and about the book, and then after that, we'll have a general round table <coughs> discussion and also solic solicit questions from you. So I don't know how you guys want to start. Do you want to just start with Michael, and we'll, we'll go from... I thought we were just going straight into the round table, but I didn't know. Okay, um, <laughs> we can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's fine too. Yeah. yeah. I'll calculate it. I don't have prepared. You don't have any. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I, I can. I could. I don't need to be prepared. Yeah. <laughs> I have something I could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do this, man. I mean, not much. I mean, a couple minutes worth. But uh, I've been. I mean, I think our generation, the exception of Jesse, who thinks is as young and fresh as our generation, but is actually significantly older. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's kind of an existential crisis on, on how we position our work relative to generations <coughs> that have preceded us. What is our work is about? What is this work about? And there's some theoretical anxiety about, are we a generation of thinkers? Are we a generation of practitioners? Are we a generation defined by our tools? in terms of being digital or not digital. Uh, 
And I think it's helpful for me, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately, to zoom out a little bit and try to determine where the project of architecture is here. And uh, there's two things I'd just like to mention very quickly. One is that David Rue is incredibly late. <laughs> <laughs> One is that the, Marcelo also curated the show Matters of Sensation uh, as an artist space and um, it's kind of been instrumental in, in talking about sensation and affect. And I was actually looking at the etymology of the term affect, and I didn't realize this, but it actually comes from poetry in the 60s. That's when it was really popularized. And the affect was there was a group of poets who were talking about structure and structuralism, and there was a group of poets who were talking about affect. Structuralism was when you look at the poem and you uh, kind of piece out how it works. You look at the poem itself. Affect is how long the emotional impact of the poem stays with you after you're done reading it. So the discourse of affect sought to take the project of poetry beyond the reading into the emotional kind of content of the user. And I think that's really interesting because architects have been using that term lately uh, in, in much the same way. Um, <coughs> this gets a little complicated, so listen close. But Robert Williams <coughs> talks about how that generation of, you know, Liebeskind and Tom Main and Kuhlhaas and uh, the, the generation of perfect acts of architecture that was doing architecture as drawing, that the architectural project stopped at the paper. That he, call, he talks about a drawing being a window into an architectural project. And if you pull back that project and it stops at the paper, then you have paper architecture that is justified just by virtue of it existing in a representational form that doesn't necessarily refer to anything greater. That is to say, building. What I think Marcelo's been instrumental in teasing forth is the possibility that that project of architecture doesn't get pulled back to the paper, but in terms of affect, it's extended beyond the architectural project into something which touches on different content, which isn't necessarily conceptual or intellectual, which ends up being termed as more emotional. So I've had a lot of discussions with this group of people about that. And the, the question arises, how do you go about talking about that? How do you go about talking about an architectural generation that's less defined by concepts and intellectualization? Is it even possible? And that's why I think the book is incredibly interesting from an ontological point of view, because if the work is about something beyond the active building, the affect that you take with you after you leave the active building, but the book is more of that Robin Evans tradition that the book stops with the paper. That it really, what we're talking about here is an extension of the project of architecture with drawing it back to the point of theory and beyond to the point of affect. So there, there really hasn't been a discussion about architecture uh, in this wide of a swath, um, I don't think ever. So I think it's pretty interesting territory. I'm sure John McMorrow is the only real historian here is gonna, um, <laughs> slap me down, but uh, I'd love to you know, talk about that a little as the, pro as the progression goes forward, because, because I think there's the work, which is you know, total crap. No, I mean, <laughs> totally beautiful. I've, I've always been, Marcel's work is incredibly beautiful, um, which I think is interest for, interesting for another reason. But then I think there's the larger project of how it's situated in this group of people and how this group of people are situated in the larger discourse of architecture. World. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, as Mark mentioned, um, David is incredibly late. Um, this is David Rui, who's a, a, a partner of Rui Klein and also uh, a professor at Pratt. Yeah, and we and it, we should have announced that he was going to be late, but we wanted to make his lateness as dramatic as possible. Um, but I mean, I, I think you know, touching upon what um, Mark was saying, I mean, it, it is an, a really interesting historical question of. of how um, how to situate the, the work of, of um, patterns because it is a thing where um, I mean it, I, I, I mean I don't know maybe maybe this is ungenerous but like it, it's it's not like it's a generation that's radical in the sense that it was a breakthrough moment in terms of either a technology or a framework of thinking but it was radical in the sense that it was about the production and execution um, of of thought and technology that immediately preceded that. So, I mean, I think it's, it's actually interesting in, in terms of the fact that it, you could think of it as the 
development, the definition, the articulation and extension um, of bodies of thought that were converging you know, um, at a given amount of time. And so I think the, the word embedded is really interesting because uh, it's about, um, I mean, I don't know, just as a, an interpretation, it's about accepting the fact that there are givens that are rich very new givens that are around, you know, around, and the question is what to do with them. And it seems that, uh, that uh, I mean, I think the book is really amazing, and that's the whole reason um, why I proposed to, to Nikki and Jeff to do the, this um, event. Um, but I think, you know, it's the thing where the book production's amazing, um, and beyond the thought that goes into the book, that um, Marcelo is a rare breed within his generation in terms of the effort that's been given to to building production. But I, I guess I just yeah. want to, like, as as a more or less a restatement of what Mark was saying. I guess I'm just wondering what you think about that as a a crude historical uh -huh. contextualization, and also the question about um, building as a form of production within that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could add to that. I think. I mean, one of the things that um, perhaps characterized our generation for better or worse, especially early on, uh, you know, where we maybe began to really experiment with the issue of pattern or networks or, or you know, continuous variation and all of those things, um, was tied to it um, a thought that we could in fact generate the unified field. <laughs> and, uh, you know, bottom up design paralleling developmental biology and all of those models uh, were experimented with intensively. I mean, they're still playing themselves out you know, in various practices. I think one of the things that characterizes, I don't know if it's generational, but the very fact that there was a kind of push in your generation to really address building is the other pattern that's in a way not set, but it's actually very present, which is like the issue of typology. Yeah. Given, like, uh, you know, it's a type like your first projects or among your first are apartment houses. So yeah. those set limits and constraints as a, in a way, a top down structure within which you proliferate pattern or yeah. uh, explore the structural implications of pattern and penetration <laughs> and so forth. But that's, a, you know, a, it's an inevitable uh, development, I think. And it also is a kind of recognition of perhaps the limits of maybe the more utopian <laughs> experiments that came before. But I think that's a very important issue relative to the built work. And you know, whether it's you know at the scale of a sure. apartment building, yeah. a strip mall, or um, you know it's a smaller object. So maybe there are uh, if, you know if, if, if it's not a an historical type, it's an object type, or it's. Yeah. Um, it, but it inevitably comes into relationship, I think, with these other kinds of models and patterns, which, you know, in a way predate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, convention as well. Convention. Yeah. yeah. There, there's, some, there's something weird about this right now. Is is uh, the past tense of embed you're using, and uh, in in the way that this book it's is. Yeah, it sort of seems like what's going on here. Yeah. But the. Um, it would be, I guess, great to be, uh, the, and everyone's putting in that sort of bracketed in generational terms, and like everyone's, you know, I guess it would be great to be younger than us. But, but the, um, um, the, the, um, the, the one thing, it is true, I think, Jesse, you loomed large here in a certain way, and we, I was talking about this on the way over, you are kind of a, a father with a figure to, in a certain sense, whether you like it or not. And, and one of the things, um, absent dad. That comes, yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absent dad, probably to to the work, I think. For sure. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, and and even that's what you were, yeah, yeah, you were yeah, getting yeah, at. Yeah. And um, one of the things, though, that that does is an evolution, but maybe is this the, the kind of earliness of building and how to engage all that. But it's also, I think, taking it um, in a different direction too, where. I think the frustrations of, of trying to get beyond the part to whole relationships and, and the problems of evaluation and analysis that became the way to evaluate work was through analytical terms and trying mm -hmm. to escape that mm -hmm. was 
something that I don't think is a crisis for, for Marcelo, even at this point. I think right now it's like trying to find, if it's affect or uh, trying to find, I mean, the pattern process gets rid of that pretty much straight up, and you, and you do other things. Like, Marcelo's use of color is radically different, perhaps, than, although, than, than yours, Jesse, or somebody. You know what I mean? Like, right. the fact that you, that, that that becomes an interest of trying to find sensations, or, I don't know, you know, the question is, what are these sensations, and do we really <coughs> want to have them? But, but you know, there, there's other things at stake, you know, that are beyond uh, an, the <coughs> different ways of evaluation, let's say, than the analytical in the work. So, what do you, you know? What do we make of that, and how does that become either more fine-tuned, I suppose, as a generation, if it is, or become more? Uh, how do we start to build a new a, a discipline out of that? Even this is the kind of question that Mark was asking. I think so it's not really clear, and it and it may be just another thing to either either reject or I don't know for somebody younger who's got got the promise he's not dead yet like the rest of us. So well the big question for me too in that, in relation to that and kind of larger structure of building is um, at what level something like pattern will produce the effective condition um, is it enough to have it merely be decoration? Yeah. Yeah. You don't really believe beyond that. You're talking about organization <laughs> at a higher level. Just bottom up. Will it do yeah. uh, the same at that level? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah. Know, could you constrain it to purely decorative? I want to get on. I want to get on this stockpile. Okay. So, but, 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 <laughs> yeah, I got to add to the question though. Yeah. Because, okay. Because I think in the yeah. question, like the thing that strikes me about the office, and I do think there's mm -hmm. unity of generational interest, and I mm -hmm. think yours is particular to building, the art of building in a way, but the, I feel like patterns as a title was always a sort of MacGuffin. Like, mm -hmm. I look for the pattern in the work, yeah. and it's, some have pattern, but it, it's not there in the way you would think, and so I actually think there's a whole other mm -hmm. interest that pattern covers mm -hmm. in a way. Sure. Well, I mean, that's what I was going to make, not to dwell too much, and not to like, uh, and overlook the you know, your text, which I always, you know, I find really interesting, but I think that the, it's the same patterns, it's just a name, it doesn't, doesn't cut it, but, <laughs> but there's a little bit of that, you know, when you start a practice and with something really like, you know, triggers your imagination, it was never really about like, you know, there have been exhibitions of, you know, with the title patterns, which were, were not part of, you know, and was happening, you know, outside of it, uh, because we were never really about it, you know, it was more about like, some sort of idea or, you know, that if anything had to do much more with like, a, you know, a set of social practices, you know, around the object, understood mm -hmm. as part of the object, you know, I mean, this is like kind of some sort, you know, understanding mm -hmm. of form as like, not uh, as really a form to object, let's say, or like, or, or, you know, as he was putting it, I think, uh, <coughs> you know, equating form to object, which would say like a very, very single, a very simple understanding of object and form itself, but understanding it as a sort of large thing, you know, of course, there is a kind of analogy, which has to do with, you know, obviously the work of Jesse was really pioneering at that level. This is obviously what we, I mean, I, mean, I first was exposed to it. Uh, there's, a, there's a part that had to do with the, the possibilities of form and fields and all that, which was kind of early analogies for all that. And then it has to do with the particularities of like, uh, you know, what's known, you know, and I, and I believe the world of conventions, the, you know, all the way to like, you know, the construction, Codes, building codes, you know, all the kind of recalcitrant, <coughs> incredibly banal things that an architect That's has horrible. to kind of deal, and and usually they are, you know, theoretically one tends to leave them outside. But I think, I mean, we were always interested in like in trying to incorporate those things, you know, uh, not as a way to say, you know, building is better than not building. Uh, we never made a differentiation. I always try to like not make that differentiation because I don't think it's a good, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a valid way out because you build <coughs> better than you know. I don't think that's the goal. I think it's about building something that matters. Uh, but it, it has something to do with that. So I personally, I think, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, we don't really go about patterns, you know, in, in such a sort of, you know, uh, overarching way. And uh, uh, it's a much, at this point, it's really something that is kind of in the background. Uh, we tend to think of problems in a much more, you know, nuanced way or cope, you know. You know and obviously things change, you know, so. 
Well, for the I mean, video, could you guys talk into mics? Huh? Um, you know, the, uh, there's, I don't know, there, there was something, uh, I don't know, I, I'm teaching some, uh, I'm teaching a contemporary urbanism uh, seminar, and we're talking about something today, and, uh, but the idea was, was basically the, the idea that uh, when you teach, like one, one of the things that happens when you teach is that you you evoke different um, tendencies and different um, operations that happen in architecture. And that maybe the best thing that a teacher can do is to evoke an idea of an artificial world in the sense that um, particular techniques or particular proclivities within the discipline could be invoked into a student um, and that that the student doesn't get a full understanding of what the professor is saying, um, that the student kind of puts these disparate pieces together and creates their own coherent world of what she or he thinks the professor is saying. And so I think, it, it, I mean, it could be really interesting to think of this as like a, a fictional future, like, you know, the way that Marcelo misinterprets what Jesse says um, uh, is a thing <laughs> that produces a, a trajectory yeah, I, yeah. and a professional I career that totally <laughs> makes sense um, in Marcelo's mind. Um, but you know, disregard whether it had any specific um, uh, clear translation um, from what he was learning from Jesse. But but I think if you think of it that way, that the manifestations that come out of, of the work of the office is a thing that you could see as like a really productive misinterpretation of exactly the things that were so inspiring to him um, that, that you know, Marcel learns as a student. And, and I, I mean, I, I want to try to keep it on the more abstract level of not, you know, what are the particulars of, of the pattern office, but I do think it's a really interesting thing about how you could create these coherent worlds, coherent artificial worlds, and, and that they take on substantive meaning as practices evolve. And, and I do think, though, that in the particular case of patterns, that um, the fact that so much of the work um, is built work um, uh, on one hand, and then a particular kind of drawing on the other that, that, that John mentions, and, and that is that, that the, the delineation, line drawing, is actually one of the things that really does carry through in the explications of the work to a really great degree. So I don't know, I, I just think of that, that we can think about this as these particular um, worldview manifestations that arise out of it, or, or not. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, um, uh, I mean, did, I mean, do you think of, of there is the, uh, of there being these possible misconnections between, like, you know, things that you learned as a student and things that <laughs> that happen thereafter, or anyone else see that in the work of patterns? Well, maybe I could get to that, <laughs> but. Uh, just wanted to touch on uh, what seems to be the two magic words, uh, pattern and embedded. Uh, and uh, in the mid-90s, back when we were in school, uh, it was very much a, a thing that we couldn't quite figure out why it was happening, but it was definitely happening that architects in our immediate circle were seemed to be moving from object to field. And some theorists like Stan, for example, explicitly wrote it uh, in a very mm -hmm. concise and blunt mm -hmm. way. And so uh, initially when Marcello started practicing and called his operation patterns, uh, I took it as a kind of a addressing of this move towards the field and architecture becoming patterned, uh, but almost synonymous with the milieu, the field, and architecture as an object dissolving into a greater set of forces and conditions. But what was interesting back then was uh, the difference between how we would talk about the work in public versus how we would talk about it in private. Uh, I remember actually looking at these dynamic weather models with Jesse, and we weren't talking about the milieu. We were talking about just how gorgeous it was hmm. uh, and how uh, significant it seemed to be uh, almost aesthetically, even though we never really uh, back then, uh, thought to discuss it as aesthetics. I think in retrospect, mm -hmm. it's more connected with what Mark was saying about affect mm -hmm. or, or just simply beauty and new aesthetic conditions, new perceptual conditions, etc. So now embedded, uh, I, t I take that, and I'm kind of guessing too, because strangely we haven't really talked about this, <laughs> but uh, 
uh, embedded, I guess it, it's implying that the architectural object is embedded in, <coughs> in, the, in the milieu. You know, so in general, um, I think what I, I'm, I'm very curious about myself, so I'm reading Marcelo always through my own interests, mm. but uh, yeah. uh, we went from field to op from object to field, but now I think it's interesting to consider returning to objects again and discuss it more explicitly, but when we go back to object, it's not kind of re-embrace this lost history, but it's going to be a little different this time, what an object means, I think. And I think it becomes a much more disciplinary issue than uh, maybe a pseudo-scientific one, you know, where we have to pretend to be going after the unified field theory. No, we're just still trying to make arch significant architectural <coughs> objects, but now, after all this interest in the field and the pattern, I think it's going to be a little different. Well, the, the, the structures that emerge after that were, I guess, parametrics and control and all of the things that you write about. But I mean, it seems like the, you know, one of the one of the uh, anxieties there, which is in a way related to the discussion about the weather pattern, is that um, it is the anxiety over aesthetics, mm. and so. Mm. You know that we one would have to then load multiple demands onto the pattern, so that it could fluidly handle structure, light, ecological issues, blah blah blah. All of those things, in a way, um, having to be quantified and justified through the use of the pattern, which is actually, you know, could be primarily an aesthetic desire mm -hmm. and intent. So, and one of the things that we realize, even with the Sofa Team Tower, is that um, one of the virtues of the pattern is redundancy, and that we would, you know, by building it up in a, in a fairly banal way, take care of all of those criteria pretty easily. But they really, having satisfied those things, it really didn't answer the problem at all. And in fact, if one were to try to index just those things, there would be almost nothing particularly architecturally significant about it either. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's a really interesting kind of uh, aspect of the pattern. Mm -hmm. it's also, yeah. to, you know, I mean, there's also a, a, there's just a lot of surplus value and um, yeah. you know redundancy, which then can be you know, used, and then one can go directly into other issues. Sure. No, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree with that. And I think the, the point that, that, that David makes yeah, about that's the, yeah, that's easy. the kind of yeah. shift from yeah. object to field, let's say. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, we also, are, I've personally experienced, I think everyone that's, you know, involved in, 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 in practice or producing objects or satisfying certain demands that at some point, everything kind of geared towards the production of a certain object. I mean, buildings are discrete objects, you know, in the field. Although you could understand patterns at kind of larger level, and that's what I, that's, that was my hint were answering the kind of name of the pattern. At a tectonic material level, you know, there's a finite aspect to it, and you have to kind of give a response to it. And, uh, and this was, uh, I mean, I remember Jesse answering the question of the plinth, you know, and, the, and, and, the, and using Yokohama as an example, and it was like really resonated with me, not to put Alejandro on the, on but because that project, you know, the Yohan project was such, such a kind of important project for our generation in terms of what it meant, the whole competition and so on. And I remember seeing the project, visiting it, and then, you know, get the sort of idea of uh, experience and uh, that hasn't been completely fulfilled, you know, that there's something missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think and it's probably philosophically less interesting, you know, in connection to all the sort of field theory and, and, the, and the beauty of these things, the relation of, you know, the kind of, because you try and you know define objects that at some point you know have to uh, appear. And I think, and this is, I mean, I didn't want to make this a generational discussion because I always like, I mean, I have my problems with that as well. It was just to kind of put into a context. But I think there's, you know, when the things become like uh, beyond generation, when these issues arise, so, and they, you know, and this was uh, Celia's question to Jesse about like, you know, the issue of the plinths and the objects on top and like how. And I thought you, you know, like I thought the the things you said, you know, are particularly relevant to just like you know, a number of practices working today in terms of like how you, you know, how you conceive of you know of, of building beyond these fields, you know, which are although really attractive, certainly aesthetically and uh, and, and, and and conceptually, sometimes like fail to provide like uh, 
you know, concrete response to, you know, to problems. Uh, but they're also not so interesting either, you know, uh, experientially when you, you know, uh, as a sub or, or something is missing to it, which was Jesse's point. So. Mm. Um, the, I've just been thinking of the, you know, the idea that there's a field and, and when something's recognized within a field, it becomes a pattern. And when something's discrete within a field, it can read like an object. These aren't necessarily separate terms, but different ways of talking about recognition. Sounds a little bit William Gibson y. But uh, that's a sliding scale from object to pattern into field. And I think David's interesting in mentioning that now that we're going back to an idea of discrete objects or discrete buildings, we're doing so with the intelligence that's existing within a larger field. I think the anxiety comes when we realize that over the last 10 years, we've had all these fields and all these patterns and all of these new tools have come into our possession. And there's some anxiety when you realize that <coughs> you can test it any way you want and that pattern is not more efficient structurally. Right, the, that gener I mean not to, I, I don't want to over-generationalize these things again, but there was a moment in this digital work when we or they were trying to impregnate information <laughs> into the surface. It was like, I have a thousand people walking into this front door and I have this ramp and that number of people shapes this ramp in this certain way and that makes it efficient and that gives it value and that makes it a legitimate architectural endeavor. And I think there's been about 20 years moving away from that model because we realize <coughs> as long as we're beholden to a model of efficiency, we're gonna lose everything in architecture. There's always a duller, more efficient way to do everything we put on the table. And I think that's where the interest in aesthetic comes in. And we've had an anxiety about talking it for 100 years. No one's, it's, I just finished a book on aesthetic theory that I spent six years working on. And the reason I did it is because I didn't know how to talk about my own work in any other way. Um, and I had <laughs> some personal anxiety about it, so it's kind of a therapeutic activity, but I think... you're at Yale and you're on the kind of That I'm at Yale and I'm Yeah, I know, working on that fucking thing. Um, <laughs> you should buy it. It's available on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I do think that there's, there's something to that, seeing this weather, weather pattern and thinking, oh, this must be a way that I can structure my system or organize my program because all these weather particles are flying just like people are gonna throw it to fly through my building. And there's been so much bullshit written about that and it never really worked. And no architect wants to admit it because we legitimized a whole generation of projects because of it. That and was now a real MacGuffin, actually, the field. Right. Was the field was good. Was well, and now I'm saying that these, these things which are emerging have other powers and those powers aren't necessarily about efficiency but they may be about aesthetics, and aesthetics is you know, probably one of the master narratives of our time when you look at a car or you look at a magazine. Everything is designed in aesthetic terms, except architecture, because we have this anxiety about talking about it. Probably a separate symposium. But I do think that Marcella's work is of particular interest because it takes the systems that we used to use to describe a building as efficient, <coughs> and recombine them to use them in terms of color and geometry and make them exquisite and beautiful and be not necessarily so apologetic about that. I, you know, I, I, never, understood, I, I never understood that w the work uh, with the, the emergent work as an optimization problem. I always saw it as a, uh, as a problem of uh, composition for architecture and trying to find ways to avoid all of the horrible arbitrary Decisions that you have to make as an architect, and um, so they were. It was aesthetic. I don't think it was. I mean, I, that's and I think patterns was one way also to deal with that. And as Jesse said, it obviously the the the, the bottom up really doesn't work. That's what I got out of here. You have to always impose a top down at some point, and and it it's become a bit of a. I think right now it's still in a moment of. Like I was saying this about the parametric, but I've said this before, but the. It's kind of in a moment where we've collapsed uh, expressionism and, and uh, positivism. Like the pattern mm -hmm. work has, has produced some other space. I don't, and I'm not sure if it's good or bad yet, but mm -hmm. where you can do wild gestures uh, of services and then find uh, sort of tautologies to rationalize them. 
And so you can produce in a math, you know, and you can say it has to be this way through the math, but you can do it through an internal argument of the pattern. And the, but the external doesn't really, uh, it never really comes into question the kind of initial gesture in terms of disconnections. And I'm not sure what it does for us, this kind of collapse of, of expressionism and positivism, but it sort of produced some other space mm -hmm. to work in. Um, you know, and at one point, it's, it, it does seem slightly, it seems, well, I mean, more slightly, it seems incredibly perverse, but, but, um, but it, that's where we are. And right. it seems. Is it positive, this arguments to justify the expression? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have it both ways. You can have your cake and eat yeah. it too. Yeah. And, and, and it allows everybody out of the, the problem of having to argue or really discuss the aesthetic mm -hmm. project ultimately through it because you can, um, because those conversations are incredibly awkward. Yeah. So, um, and you have to put taste on on and things like this, which makes everybody uncomfortable, and it involves, you know, class even and all sorts of other. Well, not always. Historically, a lot of times, it's embedded in there. Social politics becomes heavily, I think, yeah. embedded in it. So, um, well, well, I mean, uh, you know, maybe one thing to add on that to that is that it, it's uh, it's also it's not only possible to justify through positivistic means, but it's also possible to build through technologies that are now available. So it yeah. it, it, it compounds itself in terms of being able to be produced as a as a physical reality. But I mean, uh, what do you think? Like among because you're all practicing architects. I mean, what do you think are the checkpoints in terms of of production that way, like production in in terms of the things that do get built, or the checkpoints in terms of when do you like scale back the justification and, and no. let the aesthetic ride? Now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just think we're in a losing we're in a losing situation when we try to justify our work, you know, in a world of spreadsheets in yeah, terms yeah. of efficiency. Yeah, and I think. Of course, we use these tools to build the things which we want to build, but I don't see any future in which we can get away with saying, uh, I inputted all this information in the computer and it produced this unbelievably gorgeous shape with these unbelievable colors. Yeah. Which is ultimately, like, he has an ambition that's aesthetic. Yeah. Like, he has a very strong ambition that's aesthetic. Everything is, like, purpley blue and luminescent and iridescent, and there's a lot going on in his work that cannot be described in any way, shape, or form by any mode of information, efficiency, pattern recognition. I mean, the problem is even worse than that, too, because uh, I think uh, one, once a uh, significant architectural object is built, uh, it largely obstructs uh, tendencies in the milieu, uh, feel that it was supposedly generated from, oftentimes, whether it's the aesthetic content of the project or simply unanticipated spatial interests that develop out of it, end up uh, running counter to the flows that might have been actually there. So it, in many ways, it acts to resist it, too. So the power of the architectural object, I think, can't fully be explained by the spreadsheet. And I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate the uh, the willingness of uh, people to make decisions about the capital uh, to want uh, that. That's all we uh, have. You know, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's not a big, completely ugly world out there where it's entirely run by spreadsheets. It's just not true. Yeah. It's difficult to run counter to it, but there are oftentimes very important reasons for having architecture. And so. Uh, I, th I think that, like with um, in John's essay, you know, the uh, like he said something really interesting at the very beginning that um, the objective of creating a narrative of coherence is uh, a means of architectural innovation, which you know is really striking because I think that most of the times that we think of architectural innovation happening by being a disruptive act of like acting against something to delineate this as being unique from from something that is seen as being coherent. Um, and, and I, I mean, it, it's striking because within Pattern's work, there's some works that are very legible, and you could say that they're coherent in terms of a, an idea that, um, that generated it. And, and I'm thinking of like the Ningbo project, where, I mean, it's just a beautiful project in terms of the way that the massing works with the, the circulation that wraps around the building. You, you could look at it and you think, oh, you know, the, it, it's a really clear 
uh, project in terms of the diagram. Um, and on top of that, it's really, really beautiful. It's not just literally a diagram. Um, but then there are other projects where, like the, the project in Chengdu, where you look at the project and um, you, you can't read what the building organization is. You can't read what the initial gesture is of, of the building, um, at, no matter how you look at it. But it, when you look at it, it's so forcefully done, you're convinced that there must be a coherent logical idea behind it. So on one hand, there's this clarity of form that has a, a more literal sense of coherence and uh, like a, maybe a more powerful execution um, that, that has a, uh, like a seemingly a narrative of, of um, coherence to it. But I, I mean, in writing the piece, John, I was just wondering, how, like, I mean, where do you see the coherence line in, in the way that, there, sure. the, that the work is talked about as a larger output or yeah, like yeah. in I the mean, realm of buildings? I mean, I think the way I was trying to launch the idea of coherence is that it's something that I think motivates the, the work of patterns. But it might also be a, a kind of category by which you could understand like a trans-historical conception of architecture. Like, at some level, all architectures strive for a version of the coherence. I think mm -hmm. the incongruous is another kind of mm -hmm. coherence through juxtaposition. Yeah. So it's a kind uh -huh. of yeah. category. So it's a yeah, lens it's by which you can understand the development of architecture, but yeah. also parse out distinctions between contemporary practices in mm -hmm. a way. And so in one way, I think the, the work of patterns shows its evident interest in a kind of literal um, conception of uh, coherence, but I also think it's a way of thinking through, if you talked about a sort of disciplinary conception, Michael, that was embedded to analytical diagrams. Like yeah. There might be other ways of conceptualizing the act, not of trans-historical migration through um, the diagram, but rather through the objective of coherence itself. And what mm -hmm. are the means by which it's achieved? How does it train? But I thought it was a, the pa patterns take coherence, they produce, let's say, they take coherence to an extreme, where you get, let's say, qualities through quantities. So you lose you lose part to whole relationships ultimately. I mean, whatever we're, I mean, we're, it's more interesting to talk probably about specific works than these kind of strange platitudes. The thing I thought was interesting about your piece was that you started off defining it through physics and then you explained the whole thing through geometry, which I couldn't really, I, I was trying to, to figure that out, that kind of Brit, like that kind of collapse that you're doing. So, uh, but in the end, I think it's still, it's still tie, it's, it's a geometric project at the core that's trying to work its way out of the geometric into some other space. Huh. And it's not, it's not clear how exactly you get that enough escape, uh, let's say, velocity to do it, but it's, I think that's the attempt. So, so there's like a complexity, there's a complexity of geometry when it's achieved, it moves beyond object and into that on the field. And I think that's, I mean, the, I mean, I always, Alberti talks about, this term lineamenti, which is lineaments, because he was incapable of talking about the word form. The word form didn't exist for him because he was Aristotelian in his education. So he talks about lineaments, where we would use the word form or shape. Lineaments are lines. And he talks about architecture being defined by lines. And I don't know anyone's work who's as hmm. defined by lines as uh, Marcelo. And um, I, I think there's something about that that allows it to resonate in the world of object, in the world of field. That it's there's something, there's a, a level of complexity achieved when it's neither easily circumscribed as an object nor dissipated completely enough to be seen as an architecture of the... Yeah, his lines, though, I think, are... I think Jesse's work is more about lines, sure. honestly, ultimately, in lineaments. Yeah. And even when we were over here, we were talking about Jesse, we were saying, like, how do you deal with... He's like, my, everything's... I just want it, the world to be black and white and really lines. <laughs> <Like, laughs> well, and very and very really drawing lines. And I would say... Like, what does it mean when a line starts to take up, start off purple and become pink and then become, it's always purples, do you kind of red or something? You know, it becomes more, it changes in color and even in its thickness. It's not really the same line, I would say. I no, think but it is, li it's not like, I, if you compare it to like, just uh, finding a way to suss out differences in the group that we have up here, our extended family. Like, if yeah. you want to do an analysis of Marcello's work versus Tom Briscoe's, work which is totally moving away from any concept of line into double, triple, figure to figure to figurative, like there is a very clear architectural hardcore line interest mm -hmm. in this work right here. And even to the point of like panels being in terms of gradient reconfigured, but always done so geometrically, always done with 
fine breakdowns. And I agree with the kind of the idea of, I mean, that's great conceptual territory, the breakdown of line into a filigree is, is something, you know, I hadn't even thought of, but I think it's an amazing way to think about this. But to, to think about how a line or something um, architecturally recognizable dissolves into something else, you know, I think he's, there's an interest in doing that with panels. Mm -hmm. There's an interest in doing that with colors. There's an interest in doing that, like you mentioned, with lines that I hadn't thought be of before. But I think there's a lot going on in this work that's about using the system of lineage, but using it at wildly different scales and gradients than I would say anyone else working in this milieu today. It, it, it's interesting to think about the role of representation in general in the work, because you have, like the lines, I, you don't see it actually so much in the work. I would say, but in the representation of the work, maybe more. Like, I mean, sometimes in the work, like the Sayar thing. But, um, but it's not, it's not there. I mean, the drawings for me are le are are somehow a, 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 they're a turn from the '90s stuff that Jesse was doing into working drawings. Everything is labeled. Even the lines are almost somehow ambiguously construction lines and fields of effect, and or things like this. And it. And it's interesting, but the work itself is something else. So representation, I'm not, I'm not sure if it has a, what it, how it works in your work. And I think we could, you know, if you want to, like you don't see, even this project outside, it's patches almost. Like that, that piece isn't yeah. in certain <coughs> lines that is like a. No, I, mean, I think they said. But yeah. that's where it runs up against the, other, the object you're saying. The yeah. object, yeah. the yeah. type, yeah. you know. That I mean, but that, that was actually like a, I mean, I, I think that the, well, both your comments are right, but I mean, obviously, the, the, the whole sort of line work, you know, I don't want to take credit for something that I obviously did not start. I mean, obviously, started, you know, in Chessie's office and, and had a uh, huge influence on the work. Line work and It's okay, It's It's old. 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 It's other things of the work, I think I would tend to be critical of like that possibility, even in our own work, let's say. Like, uh, and this is what I would tend to think. Like, when confronted with building, you tend to see the limits of your thinking and uh, the limits of representation versus the object. You know, like what you thought that seems, and you would like them to be seems, and then they're not seems anymore, and they're not, you know, and they're not really interesting, and you don't really want them there, but they look good in the drawing. So you sort of have these two parallel worlds. I mean, this is obviously things that we're um, I'm happy to say we're still working through. I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't see the work of an architect yeah. being like completely figured out uh, early on. I see this as a kind of evolution, yeah. uh, even the kind of the use of color. Like I'm still like, I don't know. I mean, I think we're all very interested in color, but I confronted with the possibility of building. I will I, keep uh, it back uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's hard to think what you're going uh, you know, to like today and like. be there yeah. tomorrow. No, yeah. so yeah. even the issues of you know like. Uh, that's why would why. you subject the whole building to a same pattern, you know, or like, let's say, the realities of here are completely different over there. Even the complexities of just building itself, com you know, conspire to that, no? So I think the idea of coherency is one that I'm, you know, uh, not to completely jump into the Congress, as we know, that has a, you know, has a name, and it's, it's an attractive idea, but I think coherence itself, I, I see it as maybe a project that I'm, I'm becoming more and more critical about it, you know, in terms of at, at least the way you know, we we have dealt with in the last you know few years. So, in the early work, uh, I think that my favorite thing was how beautiful the curves were. It, it takes a lot of compositional control to produce figuration of that quality. I think, and then I thought it was kind of uh, bogus how um, was a kind of argument about how it dissolved into a larger virtual field. I, I, I was more interested in how well you drew those curves. <laughs> and Everyone keeps going back to his aesthetic yeah, But, but so you know, uh, after the first bad experiences with building, right, I think uh, that's when I noticed you making a pretty strong, uh, and I thought a real gutsy move away from that kind of compositional uh, mm -hmm. structure. And you started uh, fooling around with crystalline structures and weird new faceted grids and very uh, deliberately more volumetric uh, than projects that started coming out. 
and you started using words like uh, chung, chunky, and you even used that as a verb at a, at a review. I remember chunking, <laughs> like to chunk the project, and I thought it was pretty funny. You chunk the field, and, and then, <laughs> uh, and then uh, you would describe it in terms of relative uh, degrees of awkwardness, and you and Andy go that stuff. That word quite a bit out of the alley. But uh, I'm curious to hear you say more uh, in public. Like, um, what, what was that move all about? Uh, <laughs> like, because uh, in private, you can always evade questions like this. Uh, talking about sports, but uh, I don't really know what this, this uh, shift in your work was. All right. So, just to say one thing, I'm like deeply uncomfortable. I never planned for this to be like a celebratory <laughs> thing, so I'm deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> Talking about myself and that level, so you know, you, you don't have to like say it anymore. I mean, I, I think it had to do with the, you know, it's just, I mean, doing this house in Argentina was really important because it was like, you know, all these things, I mean, not, not that it didn't work, you know, but it's like you prove that your ambitions uh, weren't what you expected to be, and then and the possibilities of uh, just creating all this field and then maybe every everything to match that field didn't really do anything and actually create all these problems. Mm. And and then there has all these sort of experiential aspects to like, you know, to volume, to building, to facades, to space. like openings and I mean space is yeah, I don't know. I don't really like to talk about space but, <laughs> but it's really more like won't that, go there yet. No. Uh, but it's more a question of the I mean the perspective space, you know, which I never really Pay that much attention, and uh, and, it, it, and it was important. Uh, then it has to do also with like managing the same problem, let's say, at a larger building, and it becomes just like, you know, it becomes just too much. You no, know? and so I am, I'm really, really interested in like finding ways of like uh, working with like giving conditions, you know, with like call it the banal, call it like conventional. Uh, not in a kind of again, not in a sort of patchwork way, and this is maybe the criticism that you know that you made to the to the you know the, the Chengdu building, which could be I mean like let's say if you take material away of that building, you know it could be seen as like an assembly of things that don't really want to match together, but then material is there and it's yeah. actually in your favor, so why won't you use it? No, let's yeah. say like I mean that building has like two materials, one is incredibly cheap. And it's supposed to be flat, and it's not flat because you kind of like you see all the imperfections. The other one is like ubiquitous, you know, it's GFRC, it's composted, and it's done like you know thousands of miles away, and it's flown there, and it's stored there, and it's like seamless, and it's made to look perfect, and it looks exactly like in the computer, and it looks exactly like the rendering. And then you have the possibilities of making these two materials to match because one will match the other one, and so it looks monolithic, let's say. Mm. That you know, gives the appearance of coherence when, in fact, you know, when you look at the plan, they are very, very clear, the marketing thing. I mean, I love to be able to do something like that. Of yeah. course, people in Vienna hate it because they want, want to do, you know, you want to do more radical work, you know, and then some people, you know, like, like it. I mean, you don't really tend to, I don't, I mean, I don't pay attention to that, but it's interesting because it, like, you know, it, it has to do with, like, uh, certain proclivities of, like, what you think to, you know, like, Whole coherence tend to be in the realm of you know? But I mean, there's something to it. I mean, it's a little bit of complicated. It's not so readable for sure, as Jeffrey was saying. I mean, I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do like the idea that you could have that duality of either complete reality or that sort of obscurity in building. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, this is meant to be, um, you know, it's not meant to make Marcelo uncomfortable at all. Um, <laughs> and it's very much meant to be a celebration. And. Uh, we, you know, we wanted this to be a discussion so that you can hear more about the work, um, and as well as that it's a, a celebration of the fact that we can all have drinks together. Um, so there are drinks over there, but before we journey over there, are there any questions that you have that you'd like to ask um, Marcella or anyone else that's here? No? Okay, well you can, you can ask over drinks then. So thank you very much everyone for uh, participating.